Welcome, this is Professor Ridge in today's lesson 5.6, Rational Functions. And our first learning objective, use arrow notation. All right, using arrow notation. So we have seen the graphs of basic reciprocal functions and the square reciprocal function from our study of toolkit functions. All right, so that's pictured here in the book graphs of toolkit functions. This is the reciprocal function. And notice um, that we have what we call vertical asymptote is the y-axis, horizontal asymptote the x-axis. Same thing for uh, the uh, reciprocal square function, the squared reciprocal function. Uh, same thing, right? We got a vertical asymptote, the y-axis, and a horizontal asymptote x-axis and so the this arrow diagram or arrow notation is basically you can say all right as x let's see here on the left branch of the graph the curve approaches the x-axis that's y equals zero as x goes to negative infinity so you could see so right here excuse me okay right here we're talking about this left end here so the curve approaches the x-axis y equals zero as x goes to negative infinity that's how you could say that as x goes to negative infinity or as x approaches negative infinity meaning as you go to the left the um the function is approaching y equals zero which is the x-axis as the graph approaches x equals zero from the left the curve drops but as we approach zero from the right the curve rises so we're talking about this one so if we look here as x let's see as the graph approaches x equals zero from the left so that's coming from this side so as we get closer and closer as we go this way to zero you can see the y values are going to negative infinity all right so they didn't write the notation um, it's on the table below which we'll talk about in a minute and finally on the right branch of the graph the curve approaches the x-axis as the the curve approaches the x-axis y equals zero as x goes to infinity so which one are we doing? Oh, that, they're talking about this part. Okay. Okay, so here's table one. This is going to summarize the arrow notation to show that x or f of x, so x is on the horizontal axis, right? The x values, input values. f of x, that's the y value, right? So that's talking about if it's going up or down. And remember the y the y value that would be going up or down. So we read this as x approaches a, which is an x value, and then the minus up here as like an exponent or superscript is to say from the left. So x approaches a from the left. Okay. This one x approaches a and then the plus sign would be from the right. Now, it doesn't have to be, A could be a positive number or a negative number. We're just saying that we're looking at it from the left side or from the right side as it approaches it from the left or from the right. Okay, so that's something to really understand there. Um, X approaches infinity, right? So that's another way we can say that is X increases without bound. It's growing larger and larger and larger x approaches negative infinity so that one decreases without bound right so that's an alternate way you can you can read that f of x remember that's the y value so this is talking about the y values are going up f of x approaches infinity so the output approaches infinity or the output increases without bound right it's going up that's the way i think of it f of x approaches negative infinity so the output approaches negative infinity 
or the output decreases without bound. Again, I think of that as it's going down. So the y values are going down. And then f of x approaches a, that tells you that the output approaches some number a, right? And we're viewing this as, we're saying the y values. So this is what we're going to do for a horizontal asymptote, which again, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, so the y values are going to some fixed number. All right, so local behavior of f of x equals 1 over x, again, the reciprocal function. So if you were to uh, note that the domain for f of x is um, x is not allowed to be 0 because 1 divided by 0 is undefined. So let's put this note. Um, x is not allowed to be equal to 0. So as we approach 0, what happens? So if we approach 0 from the left, so notice this is, so if you think here's on the x-axis, here's negative 1. So if I do, um, oh, let's, let's call this, let's say this is negative 0.1, negative point, we're going to get closer, 0 0.01, 0 0.00. 01 on the negative side, on the left side. So we're looking at what's going on here. So at negative 0.1, um, if you plug it in, the reciprocal negative 0.1 is negative 10. So that would be way down here. And then if I get closer, say at 0.01, that's the reciprocal of that would be negative 100. So it's even further down, and so on. Okay, so that's what's happening on the right, the left side, sorry, the left side as x. So the way we write it in notation is we say as x approaches 0 from the left, comma, f of x, the y values, approaches negative infinity or decrease without bound or I just say goes down. Right, so the, the y values are going down. Right, so now let's look at the what happens on the right side. Okay, so on the right side, um, so if we're over here, let's say this is 1. So what happens at like 0.1, and then we're going to approach it coming this way now. So the reciprocal, reciprocal of 0.1 would be 10, which is way up above here off the chart. And then 0.01. Reciprocal will be 100, so the right side is going up. So then this one's going down. So the way we would write that in arrow notation would be as x goes to 0 from the right, f of x approaches infinity or increases without bound. Or like I say, the y values are going up. Right? The y values are going up. So figure two here gives you the notation, the arrow notation, to describe the behavior at the ends here. So as x goes to negative infinity, so that's going to the left, or you can think, I, I like to say the left side is going, is the y values are approaching zero. Okay, so that's the left side, the y values are approaching zero. And we're going to call this a horizontal asymptote. We're going to define that um, in a minute. And then the right side, as x goes to infinity, so as we're going to the right, the y values are approaching 0. Okay. And then what we just discussed from the table below, uh, just before, so as x is approaching 0 from the right, the y values are going to infinity. So that's going up. So that's this piece. And then as x goes to 0, so coming from the left side, the y values are going down, or f of x approaches negative infinity. Okay, so that's what all this notation means, and then that's what it looks like in the graph. So here's the definition of vertical asymptote. A vertical asymptote of a graph is a vertical line, x equals a, where the graph tends toward positive or negative infinity as the input approaches a from either the right either the left or the right okay so as x approaches a from the left 
f of x approaches either positive infinity or negative infinity. Okay, so it's a function, so it won't do both. So we have, again, if you think about an axis, say this is a, whatever a is. A could be a positive number or a negative number, doesn't matter. But it's some fixed value. As x approaches a from the left side, you're going to get either it's going to go increase without bound or decrease. You're going to get one of these two, but not both. Okay, so one of these, because it's a function, so we get one of these. And then on the right side, same thing. Okay, so as x approaches a from the positive, you're going to get either going up or going down. So you're going to get one of those but not both, okay? And technically, right, to be a, a vertical asymptote, you only need one of these four things. Typically, like the ones we're doing at rational functions, you'll get one on the left side and one on the right side. And again, only one, because it's a function. It would, If it had both of these, it would fail the vertical line, the vertical line test. Okay, so you're just gonna get one. Okay, and here's the definition for horizontal asymptote that I re referred to earlier. A horizontal asymptote of a graph is a horizontal line y equals b, where the graph approaches the line as the inputs increase or decrease without bound. We write it as x. So basically, it's like the in behavior that we talked about in earlier sections. As x approaches infinity, so that's going to the right, or as x approaches negative infinity, so that's going to the left. So the right end or the left end, the y values approach some fixed value b. So again, we're looking at, and we don't care if b is a positive or a negative number. It could even be 0. It could be the x-axis. So let's say this is um, y equals b, y or f of x. We're saying that the as x approaches infinity so it's going to be um, the y values are going to be going to this fixed value so we don't know if it's coming from the top or bottom so it's going to be basically one of those two okay so the right end is approaching so again it's just one of these if it's both of them, then it fails the vertical line test and it won't be a function. So it's only going to be one of those. And then on the left side, same thing. As x approaches negative infinity, f of x approaches b. So on the left side, the left end, it's going to do one of these. Okay, so you're going to get... One on the left side, one on the right side. Um, technically, to be a horizontal asymptote, you only need one of the one of these four, right? But for our rational expressions, typically we're going to get one on the left and one on the right end. Okay, so we're going to learn how to do it. Now, here's a misconception: a lot of people think that you cannot cross an asymptote. Well, for functions. That's true about vertical asymptotes. You can't cross it, right? Because then if you cross a vertical, if we had a vertical asymptote and you were to cross it like this and then approach zero, that would fail the vertical line test. So that's, tr if again, if it's a function, that can't happen. So that can't happen. But if it's a horizontal line test, I mean a horizontal asymptote, you can cross we're just describing what's happening at the end. So this can happen. In fact, we'll probably have a couple examples where we're going to cross the um, horizontal asymptote. So when I'm drawing this, we don't know if the function did something like this, came somewhere, bottomed out, and then goes back to zero. That can happen, all right? So you are allowed to cross a horizontal asymptote. And we're just describing at the very ends. At some point, it's going to get closer and closer and it'll never touch it again. But it, over here in the middle, it could have crossed it. So I wanted to point that out because 
A lot of my students have this misconception that you can't cross a horizontal asymptote, and that's not true. Okay, so when we're talking about the end behavior, yeah, over here it's not going to cross it, but it could have crossed it in the middle. Okay, so let's try using arrow notation. Um, use arrow notation to describe the end behavior and local behavior of the function graph figure one. So what this book's referring to about the local behavior here is basically the vertical asymptote. So as let's start with, um, well, let's start with the end behavior. So this is the left end. So we would say as x approaches the left side, so that'd be negative infinity, f of x is approaching this fixed y value of 4 f of x approaches 4. Okay, and now let's talk about the... Um, I'm going to number these. So this would be 1, this would be 2, 1, 2. So as x approaches, now we're going to the right, so that's going to positive infinity, or just infinity. Then f of x approaches the same fixed y value, 4. So f of x approaches 4. Okay, so now let's do the local behavior. Um, let's do this one. We'll call that one 3. Actually, let's do it the other way around. We'll call that one 4. And this one 3. Okay, so this one, so as we approach, what's this fixed x value here? 2. So as we approach... 2, so as the x values approach 2, now we're approaching 2 from the left side. So again, this um, negative up here doesn't mean anything about the sign of 2. It's saying, think of it as from the left. Okay. So as we approach 2 from the left, so the left side of 2, the y values are going down. So f of x goes to negative infinity in it. Again, another way you can interpret this is it's decreasing without bound. And then for 4, as x approaches 2, now this time we're approaching it from the right side. So see, this is on the right side of 2. So we're going as x goes from the right. Okay, even though that arrow I drew is, I'm drawing it going to the left, but we're approaching it from the right side. That's the way you got to think of it. On the right side of 2, the y values are going up. So f of x increases without bound. f of x goes to infinity. f of x goes up. That's the way I think of it. Example 2, using transformations to graph a rational function. Sketch a graph of the reciprocal function shifted 2 units to the left and up 3 units. So if you remember our basic toolkit function, the one we just did, 1 over x looks like this, basically. with a, And now we're going to take this vertical asymptote and we're going to shift it two units to the left. So basically, I'm going to go two units to the left. And then up three units. So the horizontal asymptote up three. Basically, what I do when I do the shifts, I think of it as, um, I think of it as moving the origin. And then what I'm going to do is now I'm going to graph this basic graph and I'm going to pretend this is a zero zero for this one. So basically, if I want to graph, and if you remember the, um, the transformations, if I'm going to do a horizontal shift, that's going to subtract a negative two, so it'd be plus two. Right, you do the opposite. So that's moving to the side, inside with the function. And then the up three would be the plus three out here. Okay, and if I want to make this look nice, I can make it one fraction. But those are the basic transformations. And again, I'm just going to graph the basic one and pretend this is the origin. 
So if you know the basic one, when you do um, zeros undefined, right? So that's your asymptote, which is this one, y equals 3. And then, um, oh, x equals 0. Sorry, that's this one. So now x equals negative 2 is basically the 0, right? So it got shifted. So what I do then is um, if I did 1, the reciprocal 1 is 1. So again, I'm pretending this is 0, 0. 1, the reciprocal of 1 is 1. And then uh, 2, the reciprocal of 2 is 1 half. And then I do negative 1, reciprocal of negative 1 is negative 1. Negative 1 is negative 1. And then negative 2. And then from what we just talked about with the, the behavior, we know that as x approaches from here, as x approaches 0, so like if I did 1 half, the reciprocal of that would be 2. So 1 half reciprocal would be 2. And I know that this is going to infinity. So I'm just going to get that graph. Oops. Let me look down here. And then the same thing on this one. So I have this one's going decreasing without bound. So if I did one half to, I mean, I can plot points, but I don't really need to. I, oh, dang. My tablet's not cooperating. There we go. Okay, so then basically that's it, right? So we did the transformation um, with the four in behaviors. You can plot a couple points. You don't, you know, I always do the one, the two, one half, and the same thing on the negative side. We can also talk about symmetry, right? It's this one's symmetric about the origin. So the, so if I, if I get one, one, I automatically get negative one, negative one. So I basically I do the positive side and the negatives of the, the, um, the symmetric about the origin. So you change both signs. And then the discussion we just did about the vertical and horizontal asymptotes. That gets me the rest of the graph. Okay, moving on to the next learning objective. Solve applied problems involving rational functions. Okay, a rational function is a function that can be written as a quotient of two polynomial functions, p of x and q of x. So basically the top is a polynomial function. We have it written in descending order here. And then the bottom is a polynomial function. And again, written in descending order. And then for it to be defined for the domain, the denominator cannot equal zero. So that's what's listed here. Q of X cannot equal zero. Okay. So again, a rational function is just a ratio. That's where the rational part comes of two polynomials. Example three, solving an applied problem involving a rational function. After running out of prepackaged supplies, a nurse in a refugee camp is preparing an intravenous sugar solution for patients in the camp hospital. A large mixing tank currently contains 100 gallons of distilled water into which 5 pounds of sugar have been mixed. A tap will open pouring 10 gallons per minute of distilled water into the tank at the same time sugar is poured in the tank at a rate of 1 pound per minute. Find the ratio of sugar to water in pounds per gallon in the tank after 12 minutes. Is that a greater ratio of sugar to water in pounds per gallon than at the beginning. Okay, so let's set up a function for this. So we start out with, all right, let's start out with water. And we're going to call in the tank, right? So we start out with 100 gallons of water. So let's see, we're going to do water as a function of time. So we have 100 gallons of water plus 10 t because we're pouring in let's see 10 gallons per minute into this tank so right now the tank at time zero we have 100 gallons of water 
and five pounds of sugar, and we're mixing it. Okay. Now for the sugar, oh, well, then this is in gallons. And then for our sugar, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to call that S of T for sugar. We started out with the five pounds, and then we're adding one pound per minute. And then this is in pounds. Okay. And we want to find the ratio of sugar. Let's see here. Find the ratio of sugar to water after 12 minutes. So the ratio, we'll call that, um, they're using C. So the ratio of sugar to water and we'll call that um, C so we get C of T is equal to sugar to water so sugar is going to be on top 5 plus T and notice that's in pounds per gallon. And then uh, water is going to be on bottom. So this is our rational function. We have a ratio of two polynomials. OK, so now we can answer the first part. Find the ratio of sugar to water in pounds per gallon in the tank after 12 minutes. So they're saying, so find basically C of 12. So we just plug in 12. 100 plus 10 times 12. So that is equal to 17 over, let's see, that's 200 and, let's see, 120 and 100, 220. Right, and do we want to convert that to a decimal, maybe? No, okay, so that's the first part. Now the second part, is that a greater ratio of sugar to water uh, than in the beginning? So this is pounds of sugar per gallon, right, of water. Is that a greater ratio um, in pounds per gallon than at the beginning? So let's see, the beginning, that was when it was C sub zero which would be the 100, oh, I'm sorry, 5 plus 0 is 5. 100 plus 0 is 100, which reduces to 1 20th. So is 1 20th bigger than, let's, let's get common denominators. So if I times this by 11, that gets me 220. Or I could convert them both to decimal numbers, and then I can compare them that way. But I noticed that 11 times 2 is 22. So to me, that was a little quicker than getting out my calculator. So you can see 1120 is less than uh, 1720. So is, the, is that a greater ratio? So the answer is yes. Yes. Um, C of 12 is greater than. So the ratio of sugar to water is greater at 12 minutes than it is at the beginning. I guess I should have wrote those in words. The ratio of sugar to water at 12 minutes is greater than the ratio of sugar to water in the beginning. Okay, on to the next objective. Find the domains of rational functions. The domain of a rational function includes all real numbers except those that cause the denominator to equal zero. So basically, anything that makes the denominator zero, you have to exclude it from the domain. Example four, find the domain of f of x equals x plus three over x squared minus nine. So again, for rational functions, the domain of rational functions includes all real numbers except those that cause the denominator to equal zero. So our first step is figure out what makes the denominator zero. So you just to find the domain. So we're not solving this. We're looking for the domain. Okay. 
So you can say, all right, what's the denominator? What makes it equal zero? So that's step one, all right? Set the denominator equal to zero. So we got a, the denominator is a quadratic equation now, or quadratic function. So we set it equal to zero. We factor it, or you can use quadratic formula if you like. Hopefully, you know, the difference of squares shortcut for a binomial of the difference of two squares. It's just x plus 3, x minus 3. Okay. Then you set each of those equal to 0. And then don't forget, you switch the sign for the shortcut. Or you subtract 3 from both sides. However you want to think of that. So x is 3. Okay, so we have two, um, two things that make the denominator zero. So solidifying x values cause the denominator equals zero. That's what we did, step two. And then the domain is all real numbers except those. So all real numbers, the domain is all real numbers. So a couple ways we can write it. We can use set builder notation set of all x's such that x is a real number and x is not equal to negative 3 and then when you do a negation you change the or to an and and x cannot equal 3 right so you can do it that way or remember we want to use interval notation so if you think of the x-axis we're excluding through negative 3 we're excluding three, so you're going to have an open circle at those spots. And then it's going to be everything else. So it's going to be, basically, you're going to take the x-axis, all real numbers, and split it into three pieces. So that would be negative infinity to negative three with a parenthesis. Union, negative three to three. Union, three to infinity. So the three pieces of the number line. So that's excluding those two numbers. So if you exclude two numbers, you get three pieces on the number line. If you exclude three, you'll get four, so on. Okay, I wanted to point out um, the graph that the book mentions in the answer for this problem is um, if you look at the graph, you got a vertical asymptote at x equals three, which is one of the uh, things the function is not defined at x equals positive 3, negative 3. But look at at negative 3. There's not a vertical asymptote. There's a hole here. So x equals 3 is the vertical asymptote. And there's a hole at the graph where it's undefined at x equals negative 3. But it doesn't create a vertical asymptote. And again, we're going to discuss that in greater detail later in the section. So there's, a, there's something about this function that causes there to be a hole there instead of vertical asymptote. So we'll, again, we'll talk about that in greater detail later on. Which brings us to the next learning objective, identify vertical asymptotes. So part of that is when is it a vertical asymptote? When is it a hole? Okay, so given a rational function, identify any vertical as asymptote of its graph. So you're going to factor the numerator and the denominator, so both. Factor everything. Note any restrictions in the domain of the function. So before you do anything else, so you have everything factored, whatever makes the bottom equal to zero will be restricted from the domain. Okay? And then reduce the expression by canceling common factors in the numerator and denominator. Now here's where you get the holes. Note that any values that cause the denominator to be zero in the simplified version, so after you reduce it, that's where you get vertical asymptotes. And any restrictions in the domain that were in the asymptote that were asymptotes do not occur. So basically, the things that you canceled in step three, those are going to create holes. These are what we call removable discontinuities. That's a term we use in calculus, but basically you're going to have a hole. So, so basically if we factored the top, okay, it's factored and there's nothing to do there. And if you factor the bottom, 
which we did was x plus 3, x minus 3, right? So the, um, the domain is restricted at plus and minus 3 like we did before, but when you reduce it, so now if I reduce this, this x plus 3 cancels, and then you have to make a note of the one that you canceled. Still, you have to write provided x is not equal to negative 3, and it can't be positive 3 because then this would be undefined. So these are equal it provided x is not equal to negative 3, and that's what creates the hole at negative 3 is the part that was canceled. And the part that's still there, that makes the vertical asymptote. Okay, so that's basically all this how-to thing is saying. So you're going to factor the top and bottom. You're going to, before you reduce, you know what the domain is. Then you reduce anything that cancels, that will create holes. Anything that's left over will create vertical asymptotes. And we're talking about the denominator, right? We're looking at the denominator. Okay, so let's try example five here. So we have this function, rational function. We want to factor the numerator. Well, it doesn't factor, so we leave it alone. Factor the denominator. So just to make things easier, I'm going to take out negative 1 and rearrange it. So it'll be x squared plus x minus 2. Okay, you don't have to do that, but the way that it, the way my brain works for factoring polynomials or trinomials, I like to have x squared. I like it descending order. So if, the, if, if it's negative x squared, I factor out a negative 1. And then I can do my normal technique, factors of 2 that subtract to 1. Well, it's just 2 and 1. The bigger one gets the middle sign. And to get negative 2, the signs have to be opposites. So now I can note my domain, what's getting restricted x cannot equal, remember, switch the sign, negative 2, x can't equal 1. Now, when I reduce it, nothing reduces, so you can't reduce it. So then my vertical asymptotes, I just put v a, or v what's left over after you reduce it, so nothing cancels, so that's reduced. So what makes the bottom equal to 0? And it's basically these. Um, but when you do vertical asymptotes, you put equal, not not equal. And in the English sense, not the mathematical sense, right? So mathematical sense would be or, and then 1. Okay, so if I look at the graph, let me graph that on Desmos and show you there'll be two vertical asymptotes. Okay, and then let me draw in the asymptotes here. So you got, okay, so here's the function, 5 plus 2x squared over 2 minus x minus x squared. And we said x equals um, 1 is a vertical asymptote. And you can see how the graph, as x approaches 1 from the left side, it's going to infinity. And as it approaches it from the right side, it's going down to negative infinity. And then if I do x equals negative 2, you can see that that's the other asymptote, vertical asymptote that we found. And same thing. So as x approaches negative 2 from the left side, it's decreasing without bound. It's going down to negative infinity. And on the right side of negative 2, it's increasing. It's going to positive infinity. Okay? So that's your graph like that. Okay, so removable discontinuities. Occasionally, a graph will contain a hole, a single point where the graph is not defined, indicated by an open circle. We call such a hole a removable, removable discontinuity. So that's like the one we did a few examples back, right here, where we had the hole at x equals negative 3. Because if you put in negative 3, you would get 0 over 0, which is undefined, but it doesn't create an asymptote. Okay, so now 
removable discontinuities of rational functions um, occur in a graph of a rational function at x equals a if a is a zero for a factor in the denominator that is common with a factor in the numerator. So if we can cancel that factor, then that's what's going to create that hole, and it won't be a vertical asymptote. So we factor, we factor the numerator and denominator and check for common factors. If we find any, we set the common factor equal to zero and solve. This is the location of the removable discontinuity. This is true if the multiplicity of the factor is greater than or equal to that in the numerator. If the multiplicity of this factor is greater in the denominator, then there's still an asymptote at that value. So basically you have to, if you can cancel, let's say you have two factors in the top and three factors in the bottom, you can cancel two of them, but that still leaves one left over in the bottom, which will create the um, asymptote. So basically if it's, if they all cancel out, then it's going to create a hole. Okay, let's look at example six to see if we can figure this out. Identify vertical asymptotes or removal discontinuities from a graph. So here's the, here's the function, um, x minus two over x squared minus four. So our first step, let's go back to that page. We're going to factor both the numerator and denominator. So we're going to, let's see, the numerator is factored, nothing we can do there. The bottom, again, that's that difference of squares. So x plus 2, x minus 2. And then before we reduce it, we're going to notice our domain. We're going to restrict x can't be negative 2, x can't be positive 2, right? Switch the signs. Now we're going to reduce it. So if we reduce it, the x minus 2's cancel. x minus 2's cancel, and we're left with 1 over x plus 2. Now, in this, we don't need the parentheses anymore. It's just one thing down there. So now this, now we don't have to list both of these things because we, from looking at the function, we know that x can't be negative 2, but this function is different from the original function because we lost this information about x can't be positive 2. So we need to list that, and that's where we're going to get our whole. So it's still, the domain is still the same, right? But when we write the function down here, we have to list this specifically, right? So if I want to know what the domain is, the domain is x can't be negative 2 and because I wrote this also x is not allowed to be 2 because I'm restricting it okay so we still have the same domain now so that's important that you list the one that you cancel that one that cancels that's going to create a hole there's a hole at x equals 2 and we can figure out what that what what the uh, where we're going to put the open circle by plugging it into here. So if we did uh, put two, it would be one. So we're going to put in one over two plus two is one fourth. There's a hole at two and one fourth. But see, if you put two in the original one, you get zero. Two squared is four. You get zero over zero, which is undefined. So that's why you got to put an open circle there at that spot when you were to, if you were to graph it. So you would go to two, one fourth and put an open circle there. Okay. Because it's undefined in the original one. Okay. And then we're going to have a vertical asymptote at the one that's left over. So vertical asymptote be X equals negative two. So then you go to negative two and put a vertical asymptote. Okay, and then you go on your merry way to graphing. Uh, we'll talk about horizontal asymptotes, so which would be the um, x-axis in this case. And then you can go ahead and kind of 
figure out what the graph's going to look like. It's probably going to be something. It's probably going to be something like this. Like that. Okay, so you can go on Desmos and see. And in fact, let's do that. Okay, so you can see I have a vertical asymptote at x equals negative 2. So let me type that in. Okay, and then um, at x equals, now look, if I do k of 0, oops, k of 0, not 0, k of 2, you see it's undefined. Now, the bad thing about Desmos here is they don't show you that, so you just have to understand that. So if I go and click on it at 2, do you see how you get that open circle? So when I draw it by hand, I need to put that open circle there, which is what I was talking about over here. Okay. And how do I know it's at 1 fourth? Well, you put in the 2 in the reduced, in the reduced form and know that it's not equal to... Um, one fourth because you got to put it in the original function, which is undefined. Okay, but it's going to be it's going to approach this number in the reduced form. And hopefully that didn't make too confuse you too much, but <laughs> that's the way you would have to do it. All right, let's move on. Okay, so the next learning objective: identifying horizontal asymptotes. Okay, so in the text you can read the, the three examples they illustrate here. So for horizontal asymptotes, the horizontal asymptote of a rational function can be determined by looking at the degrees of the numerator and denominator. So the degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator. So, the, so if the numerator, the top, is less than the bottom, the denominator, Okay, so if top is degree 2 and the bottom is degree 3, then your horizontal asymptote is going to be the x-axis, y equals 0. So let's, right, that's the x-axis. Okay, the degree of the numerator is greater than the degree of the denominator, so they should do subcases here. If the top is bigger than the bottom, there's no horizontal asymptote. However, if the top is bigger than the bottom by exactly one degree. So if the top is degree three and the bottom's degree two, the top's one bigger than the bottom, you get what's called a slant asymptote. That's not horizontal. You're gonna you're going to get a line like that. Or it could be the other way, right? It could be a positive slope or a negative slope, doesn't matter. So that'd be a slant asymptote. Okay, so that'd be a slant asymptote. Okay, and then if the top is equal to the bottom, then the horizontal asymptote is a ratio of the leading coefficients. So if the top is at x squared, the bottoms are x squared, you're going to do y equals the, the leading coefficient of the top, the leading coefficient of the bottom, and whatever that number is. And again, we'll do some examples in a minute here. Okay, so let's look at example A here. G of x is 6x to the third minus 10x over 2x to the third plus 5x squared. So the degree of the top is 3. The degree of the bottom is 3 because it's x cubed, x cubed. So our, our horizontal asymptote, I'm just going to put HA is going to be y equals the leading coefficient of the top divided by the leading coefficient of the bottom. So that'd be y equals 3. So if I were to graph that, if I went to Desmos and go to y equals 3, the end behavior is going to be one of those, one of these. Okay, one of those, and then same thing over here. One of these. And again, remember what I said earlier. We might, we can cross this horizontal asymptote, um, but the end behavior, this is approaching that fixed number. So if you go to, so I encourage you to go to Desmos, type this in, and then type in y equals 3, and then just look at the far left side and the far right side, they're approaching that line. 
And if you go out far enough, it'll look like it, it's on that line exactly. All right. So if I go out far enough, it's, it's going to look like it's on the line, but if it's not touching it out there, it's getting closer and closer and closer to it without touching it at the end. All right. So now moving on to B. Um, the degree of the top is two. degree of the bottom is one so the top is exactly one bigger than the bottom so for B the way you find a slant asymptote is you have to divide this and um, you can use long division if the bottom is um, something like x squared or x cubed and the tops one higher since this is x plus two I can use synthetic division so I'm going to divide synthetically Remember, you switch the sign, then the coefficients, 1, negative 4, 1, and then bring down the first one, multiply, multiply. Now, for the slant asymptote, you're going to say, okay, the quotient is the, the slant asymptote is going to be the quotient and throw out the remainder. So the quotient is going to be x minus 6. x, 1x minus 6. So if I were, in fact, let's do that on Desmos so you can see. Okay, so here's the graph. And then if I did the, um, okay, let's do the vertical asymptote. x equals negative 2. Okay, that's the vertical asymptote. And then the horizontal asymptote, there isn't one, but there's a slant. Y, we did the division. Y equals, you throw out the remainder, so we got X minus 6. So that's going to be Y equals X minus 6. And you can see that the, gra the functions approaching that line, the slant asymptote. And as I go further to the left, it's getting closer. You can, you can all, it's hard to see the difference, right? It's approaching that line. And again, if I zoom in on it, you can see they're separate, but you're getting closer and closer. Okay, so as x goes to negative infinity, the y value is going to approach that line. And as x goes to positive infinity, same thing. All right, so that's a slant asymptote. And then the third case here, c, would be... Um, the degree of the top is 2, degree of the bottom is 3. So if the top is smaller than the bottom, it's just going to be, um, so degree is 2, degree is 3. So the third case is if the top is smaller than the bottom, then it's just going to be the x-axis, y equals 0. So you can say x-axis or y equals 0. Right, that's the same thing. So like if I go to Desmos and did y equals 0, y equals 0, let's turn off all this other one, y equals 0, you can see is on the x-axis. Right? Let me change the color so you can see that. Okay. So y equals 0 is the x-axis, or is on the x-axis, I should say. Okay, in the sugar, example 8, in the sugar concentration problem earlier, we created this function, rational function. Find the horizontal asymptote and interpret it in context of the problem. So again, we got 5 plus t for the numerator, 1 plus 10t for the denominator. The degrees are equal, so the horizontal asymptote would be, um, since degrees are equal, it's going to be y equals the leading coefficient. Now you got to think leading coefficient is in descending order. So it will be 1 and 10. So it will be 1 tenth. So, and then the top was pounds and the bottom was uh, gallons. So 1 tenth pound. So basically, we're saying as x goes to infinity, so as, as time moves on, it's going to get diluted 
it's going to approach that dilution of one pound per sugar per 10 gallons of water. Okay, so it'll be one pound. So as time goes on, as it gets larger and larger and larger, the concentration rate is going to approach one tenth, one pound sugar per 10 gallons of water. So let me write that in notation. So as T, we can say as T approaches infinity, so as time gets increases without bound, um, C of T approaches one tenth. Okay. Okay, identify horizontal and vertical asymptotes. Find the horizontal and vertical asymptotes. This function, okay, they, they did the hardest part for us. It's factored already. So that's the first step. So for vertical asymptotes, um, we're going to look first to see if we can reduce this. Okay, nothing reduces. So our domain and our vertical asymptotes will be this, will be, you know, related, right? So if you restrict it from the domain, this reduced form, it's going to create a vertical asymptote. So it'll be vertical asymptotes will be um, x equals vertical asymptotes. Be x equals 1, x equals negative 2. Remember, it's the zeros of the denominator after it's reduced. That'll get you your vertical asymptotes. So just change all those signs. And then a horizontal asymptote is we got to look at the degree. If I multiply this out, I'm going to get x squared plus something x plus or minus 6. Um, so all we care about is x squared, right? There's two factors of x, so x squared. Here there's three factors of x, so that's degree 3. So the top is smaller than the bottom. The Again, looking at the degrees, 2 is less than 3, so that says it's going to be the x-axis, or y equals 0. Okay, and that's it. And I'm going to leave it to you as an exercise. Go to Desmos, type this in, and then type in x equals 1, x equals negative 2, x equals 5. Type in y equals 0 to verify that those are the asymptotes that we identified. Okay, so I'll leave that for you to try. Intercepts of a rational function. A rational function will have a y-intercept at f of 0 if the function is defined at 0. So basically, provided this is defined, you're going to have a, a y-intercept. So you plug in 0 for x, work it out. That y-value will be your 0, comma, f of 0 will be your y-intercept. A rational function will not have a y-intercept if the function is not defined at 0. Likewise, a rational function will have an x-intercept at the inputs that cause the outputs to be 0. Since a fraction can only equal 0, wait, since a fraction is only equal to 0 when the denominator is 0, x-intercepts can only occur when the denominator, when, sorry, when the numerator of the rational function is equal to 0. So remember, if you have 0 over any number other than 0, um, then that is equal to 0. So if we want the y value to be 0, we just look at the numerator when it's 0. And then if it's any number over 0, that's undefined. So that's what gives us, If again, it has to be reduced first. Anything that makes the bottom undefined gives us the vertical asymptotes. I mean, Anything that makes the bottom zero will give us vertical asymptotes. Anything that gives makes the numerator, and again, it has to be reduced. Um, anything that would make the numerator zero would be the x-intercepts. So for our x-intercepts, we're just going to set the numerator equal to zero. So x minus 2, x plus 3 equal to zero. And then, okay, the hard part's done. It's factored. So then set each factor equal to 0. And then we're going to add 2. So x is 2. Subtract 3. So x is negative 3. So our x-intercepts would be 2, 0, 
and negative 3, 0. Now our y-intercept, that one's easy. You're just going to put in 0 for x. So f of 0 is equal to 0 minus 2. 0 plus 3. That one, this one's easier when it's not factored because it's just going to be the constants. But um, no big deal. We can still do it. 0 plus 2. 0 minus 5. So that's negative 2 times 3 is negative 6. Negative and a negative make positive 10, which reduces to negative 3 fifths. Okay, so we get negative 3 fifths. So that will be 0 for x, negative 3 fifths. And again, if you did the decimals like I I asked you to try it on your own. You don't have to, but you can verify that these are the x-intercepts and the y-intercept. The, the book posted this picture, figure 16, of the graph of that. So if you didn't go to Desmos, here's, here's the graph. Um, and you can see the x-intercepts are at negative 3, 0, and 2, 0. The vertical asymptotes are x equals negative 2, x equals 1, x equals 5, is that what we got? 1, 5, negative 2. 1, 5, negative 2, yep. And the horizontal asymptote was the uh, x-axis, y equals 0. And you can see how the end, the left end is approaching 0, the right end is approaching 0. And then uh, the y-intercept is negative points, it's 0, negative 0. 0.6. That's the same thing as 3, 3 fifths negative 0.6. All right. On to the next learning, or the last learning objective, graphing, graph rational functions. So we're going to put all this together, and now we're going to graph a rational function. Okay, so here's the technique. And again, once you get, it looks like a lot. It's a lot of steps, but once you get the hang of it, it's not so bad. Um, so first, you want to find, evaluate the function at, zero to find any y-intercepts. So anytime you graph, you want to know intercepts. What's the x-intercepts? What's the y-intercept? So that's kind of like standard fare. Okay, then you're going to find uh, the, the asymptotes, since these are rational functions. So that involves factoring the numerator and denominator. For factors in the numerator not common to the denominator, where each factor numerator is zero to find the x-intercepts. So now you're going to find the x-intercepts, like I said, x-intercepts, y-intercepts. And then you're going to find the multiplicities of the x-intercepts to determine the behavior of those graphs. So that still works. Find the factors in the denominator. Note the multiplicities of zeros to determine local behavior for those factors not in common in the numerator. Find the vertical asymptotes by setting those equals zero and solve. So anything, so think about it, if you reduce it, are there any left over? Those are going to be vertical asymptotes. If, if they all cancel, so think about it reduced, if they all, if all those factors canceled, those common factors, those are going to give you a holes. If there's anything left over, those are going to give you vertical asymptotes. And then for factors in the denominator common to the factors in the numerator, that's what I just said, find the, the the holes, right? And then compare the degree in the numerator denominator to determine the horizontal or slant, and then sketch the graph. All right, so let's try one of these, and I'll kind of show you the way I approach it. Kind of similar to this, but maybe a little different. All right, so let's see. So I'm going to find the... I like to actually start with all my asymptotes first. So let's look for horizontal. So the top's going to be x squared, and the bottom's going to be x squared times x. So we got, basically, if we were to multiply it out, you would get x squared over x cubed. So I just take x times x. That would be x squared, and then it would be plus 5x, or whatever. It'd be minus 3x plus 2x minus 6. I just care about the first term. So it's going to be x squared times x on the bottom. The, 
top is degree two, bottom's degree three, so that's going to give me a horizontal asymptote of y equals zero. So I'm going to put a dotted line at y equals zero for my horizontal asymptote. And then now I'm going to do my vertical asymptotes. Does anything does anything simplify? Let me erase all this extra dots here. And nothing, okay, it's reduced, so, I mean, it's factored, nothing cancels. So anything that's going to be left in the denominator is going to give me um, vertical asymptotes. So vertical asymptotes will be x equals negative 1 and then x equals 2. So remember, just change the sign because you're setting it equal to 0 and solving it. So then, so if you had x plus 1 equal to zero and then you subtract one okay so the shortcut just change that sign all right so now I have vertical asymptotes at those two spots x equals two x equals negative one and now I'm um, so again I'm going a little out of order from what we just presented now I'm going to look for my x-intercepts and my y-intercept. Okay, so my x-intercepts are where the numerator is equal to 0. So where x plus 2, x minus 3 equals 0. So that would be x equals... Wait, is that right? x equals 2 and x equals negative 3. Oh, I'm sorry, x equals negative 2. I was kind of confused because I was like, wait, how can it be like that? So x equals negative 2 and x equals 3. All right, so 3, I'm going to put a dot for my x-intercepts, negative 2. See, I couldn't have had it at 2. I forgot to switch the sign. Anyway, sorry about that. Okay, so that's my x-intercept. Sometimes it's nice to see when I make a mistake, so I leave it. Um, x equals, okay, so for the y-intercept, that's when you put in 0 for x. So again, we're going to get 0 plus 2, 0 minus 3, 0 plus 1 squared, 0 minus 2. So that is negative 6, 1 times negative 2, so that's 3. So our y-intercept is 0, 3. x-intercepts 3, 0, 0, 3 for the y-intercept. Okay, now we want to uh, figure out what's going on with the, our asymptotes. So what you can do Basically, remember what, here's the way I kind of think through it. I think through, is this, um, so for that horizontal asymptotes, I'm going to get, let's change that color. I'm going to get one of these. Okay, so the way you can figure that out is you can, a couple ways you can do it. You can, um, you can just pick some points and pl plug in them in there and plot them and just see which way it's approaching. And then, uh, let's see, at x equals, so we can put in like negative 7 and plot it, see where it goes. Um, we can do like 10, whatever, just kind of get a sense for that. That's one way to do it. Let's see, now for the hor vertical asymptotes, again, we're going to get one of these on the left side, one of them on the right side. And same thing for this one. One of these on the left side, one on the right side. So we can kind of analyze what's happening. Or if you're not sure, just plug in a number and work it out. So like if I plugged in um, one. Now the thing is, if this is my y-intercept, I know for certain, I know for cer certain this can't happen because if it did I would have an x-intercept there so I know for certain that's not going to happen 
So if you just want to verify, um, plug in your calculator like negative 0.5 and work it out, and you'll see that it's going to infinity. And then, um, again, we would need some calculus to figure out where the bottom is down here. Um, so like if I put in 1, I'd get, so if I did f of 1, so we don't have calculus, so what we have to do is just kind of guess. So if we put in 1, we get 2 plus 1 is 3 times negative 2. 1 plus 1 is 2 squared is 4. And then 1 minus 2 is negative 1. So we get negative 6 over negative 4, which is 1.5, right about there. So where's the bottom? Um, not sure, right? But I can tell you this, this, if I did 1.5, I can tell you for sure I know it's not doing this, because again, I would get another x-intercept. So I know for sure that it's not crossing the x-axis. So somewhere in this region, it bottoms out. So again, I can pick points and plot them. I'm not too concerned about that right now for us. So somewhere it bottoms out, but I know it's for sure going to go up. So that's what I'd be happy with if you can do something, kind of reason through that. And then over here, now let's figure out what's going here. So if I pick like negative 3, I want to see is negative 3 above or below. And I plug it in. F of negative 3 is negative 1 times uh, negative 6 and then negative 3 plus 1 is negative 2 squared is 4 times negative 5 so we get 6 over negative 20 which is somewhere down here so I think what's happening and again I know it's not going to cross because then I'd get another x-intercept. So at this point, I know that this is kind of doing something like this, and it's going to bottom out. Again, I can pick a couple more points to get an idea, but for this class, I'm not really worried about that. In calculus, we would be worried about it. We'd figure out where the bottom is exactly. And then here, because the multiplicity of negative 2 is 1, it crosses, and it's going to go up. And again, if you're not sure, just pick a number like, uh, actually, let's keep going. Pick a number like uh, negative 1.5 and plug it in here, and you'll see it's above the x-axis. Okay. Now, um, now we got to do the left side here. So same thing. I can pick a number and plug it in and see if it's going here. But uh, the multiplicity at 3 was 1, so it's going to cross. So it's either going to do this, or it's going to do this. Okay, so we got to figure out which one it is. So what I can do is pick a number like here, 5, and see is it above or below. So if I put in 5, f of 5, and you get um, 5 plus 2 is 7. I'm just plugging it in here. 5 minus 3 is 2. 5 plus 1 is 6 squared is 36. 5 minus 2 is 3. And notice how it's all positive. 14 over 108. So it's, z it's close to 0, but I mean it's above. So again, that one point tells me it's doing this. And again, somewhere there's what we call a, a local maximum, but we need calculus for that. And then it's crossing because the multiplicity is odd. So it's going to do this. So that's a rough estimate of the graph. We can go in Desmos. It's nice as we have these wonderful tools now. We can graph it in a calculator. It's still important to understand you know, what, what to expect before you type it into a graphing calculator. But, you know, in reality, we're going to use graphing tools. But you should have an idea of what the shape's going to be, what the behavior, those things that we kind of outlined today. All right, let me put it on Desmos and show you.
Okay, so here it's on Desmos, and you could see um, looks pretty similar to what I have. Of course, it's a lot nicer and neater. I put our um, vertical asymptotes, x equals negative 1, x equals 2, y equals 0, horizontal asymptote, and you see it crosses at the x-intercepts are at negative 2, 0, 3, 0, which I believe is what we had. The y-intercept is 0, 3. Now, this is the point I was telling you. If we had calculus, we could figure this point out. It involves taking the derivative and setting it equal to 0 to find this x-coordinate. And then we can figure out the y-coordinate. Okay, but you don't have to worry about that. We're just going to roughly estimate it just by picking a number, plugging it in. Okay, and then looking at the behavior. So look at the left end is going to 0, right end is going to 0. As x approaches, um, what was this, 1? Yeah, um, this the on the left side is going to infinity, right side is going to infinity, so on. Okay, so all the pertinent details. So I think we pretty much nailed that one. And then again, with calculus, you can figure out these relative maximum and minimums. There's that one and that one. Okay, so it crosses here, it hits a peak, and then it's going back to zero. And same thing here. Crosses, hits its peak or bottom, right, and then it's going to go back to zero. All right, so there you go. Okay, so our last example here, 12, write in a rational function from intercepts and asymptotes. So write an equation. So we're basically going to go backwards. So it looks like what we're going to do, we'll call k of x, or r of x if you want. Um, so our vertical asymptotes are zeros for the denominator. So it looks like we're going to get x plus 1. Remember, switch the sign. And I, let's see, that's kind of hard to tell where that one's going to be. It looks like it's going to be... Is it going, is it x equals 2 or is it somewhere? They didn't give us enough detail, right? We'll, we'll just make it assume that it's nice and it's x equals 2. So there'd be x minus 2. Let me see what the book said. Um, yeah, that's where they're assuming it is. So we'd actually need a little more detail to know that it's x equals 2. Okay, and then it looks like a horizontal asymptote x equals 0. So the degree of the top has to be less than the degree of the bottom. We have some x-intercepts at 3 and negative 2. So let's see. We need x um, minus 3 and x plus 2. And they both cut, so those are going to be first degree. And then um, this one, how are we going to get the, so we need a degree 3 and bottom. So one of these need to be squared. And it's probably going to be this one, right, um, is squared. So I would bet you it's that one because of what the behavior of both of these are going, instead of one going up and one going down, right? So since that's squared, this one's probably going to be squared. And then you can multiply that out if you want. Oh, um, and then we need to find an initial value. So we're going to put an A in front of all of these. And then we're going to find an initial value. Which one are they using? They're using the y-intercept. That's usually a good one. So you're going to plug in negative 2 for the y-value and 0 for x to solve for a. I don't think this is like a super important thing to do, but um, just going over it. I doubt I would ask you a test question on this but it's nice to figure out you know working backwards it's always a good skill okay so now let's solve this for a 
So negative 2 equals a, that would be negative 6 over 1 times 4. So that would be, um, reduces to negative 3 halves. And then you're going to multiply by the reciprocal. So we get negative 4 thirds. Oh, the negatives cancel. Okay, so then we're going to put 4 on top and 3 on bottom. So our final answer here is going to be 4x minus 3, x plus 2 over 3, x plus 1, x minus 2 squared. And that should give us the graph above. Okay, and that brings us to the end of the lesson. So again, practice, practice, practice. Go to the end of the exercise set. Do as many of those exercises as you can, preferably all the odds, and then um, any extras that you feel like you want to do. All right, have a good day, and I'll see you next time.